Ray, it's a real treat to have both you here and also the original uh, Mighty Joe Young armature from uh, Mighty Joe Young. Yes, this is the original armature. It was made by Henry, by uh, Cunningham, uh, who did the projectors as well. Mm. And it's very uh, beautifully made. It has little washers in it so that the, it doesn't ratchet. And you can move it inch by inch, or fraction by fraction. You want to take us through the, I mean, basically what stop motion is all about. What is the process? That you well, the process is like the similar to the animated cartoon. Only instead of a flat drawing, you have a three-dimensional model. Mm -hmm. But the big problem is to keep it sync, synchronized. You have to keep the shoulders and the head all synchronized so that it'll look like he's alive and not just a puppet moving for the sake of moving. You know? mm -hmm. And each finger, as you see, is developed with little joints and, and uh, he can grab things and he can go on all fours if he wants on his, on his knuckles as a gorilla would do. Yeah, I see at the construction you've got a combination of different kinds of joints. You have these ball and socket joints and you also have these hinges and swivels. Can you tell me the difference yeah, so between Brian them? Yes, so preferred the hinges. I, I use ball and socket joints on the shoulders, but the hinges uh, sometimes the ball and sockets fold up from the tension of the rubber. Mm -hmm. And uh, O'Brien always used these uh, swivel joints rather than uh, a ball and socket. But uh, certain, the arm, to get a flexible movement, you had to have uh, the, uh, the ball and socket joint here. And then, of course, the hand. If you animate a character, do you look at the character from the camera's point of view? The camera that's taking Oh yes, taking very it? much so. Because you know, from here, the position might not be correct. It just no. has to look good to the it's taking. It's got to look from the camera. So that means walking back and forth to the camera each frame. So sometimes you walk several miles. <laughs> not how you stay in shape? <laughs> so particularly if the camera's miles away. Many times we would use a 75 millimeter lens or a uh, for a certain shots and sometimes a wide angle and it all depended. But you have to walk farther for the longer so lens. For the longer, <laughs> for the long focus lens you had to go back a number of feet. Now each I, see, frame of film. I see on the head here you've got some wire in the brow. Can you tell yes, us a little bit that, about that? That enabled him to change his expression and he had wire on the lips. Mm -hmm. And then I also used uh, um, clay. <clears throat> plasticine on the lips when he was drunk so he could protrude them and give that Habsburg look. Oh, wow. that's, that's really interesting. Now you're saying that you know in the 1940s not many people were building armatures like this. What would, in, in the 1940s, what did something like this cost? Oh, this would cost, uh, we had a, a very pro professional uh, man like Cunningham make them because they had to be precise. So they would cost in the neighborhood of 1500 to $2,000. Uh, now, how many were made for the, the picture? Well, we had four this size, and then we had one meet half the size, and then we had a small one for distant shots so the camera wouldn't have to go so far back. Mm -hmm. Now, that means Marcel Delgado made four, or two small ones, four yes. large ones. Did he use molds? Or were each no, one he came? didn't. He built them up individually. Uh, the molds came later when we O'Brien and I worked on uh, Animal World. They <coughs> wanted to produce them much more rapidly, and that was the first time we used molds at that time. Okay, so the, they each had a different look. I understand you chose one, and why? Yes. <laughs> well, Marcel built several uh, versions of the gorilla, and. Uh, uh, there was one that he built that I fell in love with, I might say. Uh, and so I called it Jennifer because uh, they were shooting uh, Lust in the Dust, what was it called? Uh, <coughs> oh, Duel in the Sun. Uh, they were shooting that at the same time. And we had to wait until they had their rushes viewed before we could view ours. And uh, so we, in the projection room, we saw a little Jennifer Jones's hand crawling over the rock as she was being shot. And I, I just uh, had to identify this one particularly, so I called it Jennifer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I noticed in King Kong uh, that his, his fur chattered quite a bit. And I noticed also in, in Mighty Joe Young, you were able to kind of control that a little bit more. Much less. The fur, yes. Well, George Lofkin devised a, a means of substituting the the uh, skin 
of a furry animal and taking it away and, and substituting rubber for it, and which was very helpful on this. And we used unborn calf. So the fur was embedded in a yes. rubber hide. It was embedded in a rubber, and it didn't move as much. In Kong, they used rabbit fur. And every time you'd touch the model, the fur would move. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you, you rationalize that by saying that wind was blowing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, so then what color was Joe's fur? It was brown. Uh, it was brownish. He tried to match all the furs of the different models so they'd be the same. Mm. Now, we found that the rubber many times would pull on the jaw, and when you tried to open it with a ball and socket, it wouldn't stay. Mm -hmm. It would collapse. So we put a screw in it, and you had to take a... Allen wrench and, and move it so the mouth would open. So this would then give yeah. you the incremental positions for the mouth by unscrewing this. Quiet. Now your, uh, the eye direction changed. How was the eyes moved? Was there a, also a ball and socket thing? Or was there well, a we just had two doll's eyes and a socket, and then uh, you take the eraser of a pencil and move them. Right. And you had to keep them in synchronization so he wouldn't look cross-eyed. Oh, oh, yeah, yes. And the blinks were achieved with clay? <laughs> no, we had a little, Marcel built little eyelids with wire. Wow. And we could uh, uh, close the eyelids at will. Oh, really? <laughs> it took really? a lot of time, but uh, it was necessary. I noticed this is such a big puppet. And I was wondering about the sets that you animated this character within. Were they large sets usually? Oh, well, they're, they're mostly rear projection. Okay. They would photograph the live action first and then reduce it on a little projection screen behind the character and then animate what, to give the illusion that it was on the same plane as the characters in the projection. You sometimes had to use a mat in the foreground. But I'm, and I'm remembering some f scenes from Mighty Joe Young. There was a scene where Joe flies in on a rope when he's destroying the nightclub, yeah. and he lands on the canopy of the building, and, and it falls just apart. falls apart. Yeah. Well, each, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of animation. Was, animated. was he wired? Uh, yeah. He had a, I had an overhead rigging, and then each section of the the uh, building that was falling I had to be on a wire. And I used that same technique in Earth versus the Flying Saucers when the buildings collapsed. Uh -huh. I would put little wires, which you don't see, and then animate with wax uh, sections of the broken building that would fall. Now, did you have help rigging <coughs> something like that? Or did they just say, hey, Ray, Ray, this is what we want you to do. Make it so it falls apart. And you just left on your own in a room. Oh, no, I just did it on my own. I had to rig it, had to have it rigged. We had some people to rig it. Mm -hmm. I would tell them what I wanted, and uh, they would rig it so that it was practical. Oh, so it was kind of broken apart ahead of time? Oh, yes. Uh, the lighthouse and various things were broken apart. But the, in that uh, particular scene, I had to break it in Mighty Joe, where he broke, uh, came down on the... On the little roof. On the roof. Uh, that had to be done because uh, that was a miniature section with rear projection behind it. So that had to be uh, animated and broken on the set rather than pre-broken. Say, Ray, would you like to give us a, a little demonstration of the stop motion process with this uh, puppet? Oh, that's very hard with just the skeleton. <laughs> but it's the same principle. For example, if he's taking that pose and he wants to raise his hand, you step out and take this and take a picture. Then you put this back, and sometimes you have two or three of these. And then you move it again, and you know <laughs> he's done it. And when you get uh, these repeated pictures of still pictures, it gives the illusion of movement. But you have to keep a, a sense of balance so that if he's on one leg, that he doesn't look like he's going to fall over. Oh, yes, and I do notice, I mean, you might move one appendage at a time, but then you're coordinating all of them to work in unison so that yes. he's flexing and moving lifelike rather than a robot. Yes, very much so, and, and that comes with experience. It, it, uh, sometimes you can... Uh, uh, in the early days, I used a stopwatch, and then I would, had a canvas on the floor, and I would go through the, the motions while he was in the jail in the prison cell. And uh, because they were slow motions, 
knocking over the fruit off the stand mm -hmm. and all that. And when he was drunk, I, uh, I, I just imagined what I saw in early films of people who were, shall we say, inebriated. Mm -hmm. And, and it's more than an issue of just making it smooth. There's an issue of timing, where uh, there'll be a movement, and then a pause, yeah. and then again another movement, and then things moving at different rates. The arm might move slower or faster than the legs. Well, the pauses are the most difficult, because you can't just have them stop. You have to have just a slight movement so that it doesn't look like a dead puppet. So it stays alive? I call it a Zeus complex, because... Uh, yeah, the ancient Greeks used to think the gods manipulated their life down on the earth, and the gods were just big people, you know, looking down and saying, you go there and you go there, and this is your destiny. So perhaps I have a Zeus complex. <laughs> I want to thank you for this great opportunity. I mean, to have you and Joe here at the same time is a real privilege for us. Well, it's an old time, and I'm happy to meet Joe again, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> Thank you.